This book? That book. What book? This book? That book is the book we're in no doubt. Is guidance for those who have fear, who have taqwa. Religious consciousness. I was stunned. that when, when I'm about to give this lecture, that I was a atheist for many, many years. From the time I was about 16 to the time I was 28. Because that will help you to understand the first story I'm going to begin with this lecture with. Because when you're an atheist, you reject God outright. <laughs> And when you do such a thing, you're committing a grave and dangerous wrong. Grave and dangerous because you are harming yourself, your soul, your person, in very profound ways. And when you convert to Islam, there's a lot of repair work to do. Because you've done such damage to yourself, you've built up so much pride, so much vanity, so many harmful qualities, that it's going to take some time to break them down and to build all over again and to construct your character. The account I'm about to begin this story with is not flattering to me. It's actually very embarrassing. And I have a difficult time sharing it with you, because it doesn't put me in a very good light. But I do think it says something about the mercy and the glory and the grandeur of God, of Allah, the Almighty and the Merciful. I'm put in a position of having to defend myself. The only difficulty I really had was telling my mo mother that I had become a Muslim, because she was a very devout Christian, and then uh, I became an atheist. That was a big shock in her life. But when I became a Muslim, that was even worse as far as she was concerned. And uh, I had a difficult time telling her. Uh, the couple days after I became a Muslim, I called her on the phone. And she was the first person that I personally notified about what I had done. And uh, it was uh, a very emotionally charged three weeks that that semester break when I went home and had to defend what I had done to my parents because uh, I had to explain Islam to them from A to Z and uh, we spent we were up till five in the morning every night my mother and I discussing religion for like two weeks straight exhausting each other but in the end she came to have a healthy respect for my religion at one point she said I understand why you became a Muslim a person who thinks the way you do I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But a person who thinks the way you do, I can understand why that religion would definitely appeal to them. And then she said to me, but I'm sorry, son, but I can never become a Muslim. And uh, after that, we agreed to discuss it for a long time, and we did. But finally, she asked me at one stage not to discuss it anymore. And so we just hardly ever discuss it anymore. Unless she brings it up, then I'll discuss it with her but I'll never bring it up first because she immediately becomes defensive and has a very difficult time on it. So you can imagine my reaction when I opened and went on to the next page which began the second surah of the Quran entitled the Tao and it began Aleph, Lam, Mim that is the book wherein no doubt is guidance for those who have fear of taqwa. I was shocked. It was just a voice from heaven was calling down to me. I had no sooner just prayed for guidance, semi-consciously, and now the next surah was answering my prayer. That! They translated it this, but this author happened to translate it as that, and I'm glad he did, because that's the literal translation. That! What? That? This? This book? That book! What book? This book? That book is the book, we're in no doubt, is guidance for those who have fear, who have taqwa. Religious consciousness. I was stunned.
And so as I read through the Quran, I was intrigued immediately. What does it say? So I started reading through the Quran. And in the beginning it describes the people will be guided by this revelation. It's as if it was written for a non-believer. I'm only surprised when Muslims think that it's read for believers and you shouldn't share it with non-believers. Its principal audience originally were mostly non-believers. They're the ones that heard it. When I read it, I felt it was definitely read for a non-believer. I'm not saying it is only it's written for everyone. It's revealed for everyone. But I could feel it talking to me. It begins, it begins by describing its audience. Who will benefit most by this? Who will benefit least by this? Who will be in sort of the middle? Describes the believers and their qualities. Three or four verses. Talks about the people who have a completely closed mind. They won't even consider this. They won't even think about it. They don't want to be bothered. Talks about them in about a line and a half. They won't consider it. No use wasting time on it. Then it talks for about 12 lines, verse 8 through 20 of the second surah, 13 lines about all those people in between. Which was me. I may have been an atheist, but I was willing to listen. I may have been an atheist, but I was curious. I wasn't an outright rejecter. I just couldn't satisfy my doubts. But here I was, in the middle, and that was me, and I knew it. As you read through that second surah, it summarizes Islam's major themes. And then from there on out, you're sort of hooked. Right? What's your first question? Well, your first question is, what's the purpose of life? Why did God create us? Did he put us here just to punish us? You start reading the second surah, and it begins to answer that question. The angels ask, why create this being? Who creates suffering and sheds blood? When we celebrate your praises and glorify your holy name. You know what the reaction was when I read that? Wait a minute, that's my question. Why put us here on earth to suffer? Why make this creature who could commit terrible wrongs and put him in this environment where he could exercise his most negative and destructive tendencies. Why didn't you make us angels and just put us up into heaven if it was within your power? That was my question. I had asked it of priests, I had asked it of rabbis, I had asked it, asked it of Buddhist monks, I had asked it of Hindus, I had asked it of Hare Krishnas on campus, I had asked it of everybody. Here I was, not but several lines into the Quran, verse 30 of the second surah, and my question is put there in the mouth of the angels. Slowly but surely the Quran begins to unravel an answer. And as it does, it takes you through so many different facets and angles of life. It interjects different parts of its message as it lures you into its design. And so as I read the Quran and proceeded along, I was trapped. It was written. I felt it was written perfectly for a non-believer. And so I would very much encourage you, if you have somebody, and he is honestly interested in Islam, but feels he doesn't have the time, point him in the direction of the Quran. A good interpretation, one that you found that you trust in English, and get him in that direction. Nothing is more powerful in showing people the way to Islam than the Quran.